Um, it looks like item five, we've got two discussion items. The first being comprehensive sustainability plan presentation by the HB and discussion of connectivity updates. Yeah, and before I'll introduce VHB here in just a second, I also wanted to let you know we're joined by um, citizen of Hillsborough, Bruce Chinnery is here today. Um, he's interested in the connectivity uh, discussion. So just so you guys are aware that Bruce is here, he may have some good ideas and things to add. Um, but but next I'll turn it over to, um, we're, we're being visited tonight by our Conference of Sustainability uh, Plan Team, VHB. It's an all-star cast here tonight with Candice Andre as our project manager and lead on the Conference of Sustainability Plan. She's been working with me um, for almost a year now on the plan, um, getting us to this point. And then I will turn it over to Candice and she can also introduce the other folks that are here. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here with you tonight. Um, can everyone see the screen, the presentation? Perfect. Yeah. Um, so yes, as Stephanie mentioned, we are here tonight um, really to share some of our, of our progress to date on the Hillsborough Comprehensive Sustainability Plan. Um, but we really want to hear from you. So um, my name is Candace Andre. I'm the project manager for this project. Um, but tonight I have with me Don Bryson, who is um, a transportation expert on the team. Um, also Margaret Tartala, who has been helping um, lead this plan and coordinate with the town. And then Lauren Blackburn is going to um, help me present some of the information tonight. So um, I welcome any questions. Um, we'll open it up for discussion. There's probably going to be a lot of information just to take in because we um, missed our November date with you guys. So please feel free if you need me to go back on anything. I'm happy to do that. So just speak up. Um, but what we want to do today is really give you our progress to date, give you a little bit um, of some insight into the survey results that we got from our community visioning exercises, um, talk through the existing efforts, town priorities, and um, some of our chapter sections, and then give you some ideas on um, the types of recommendations that you may see in the plan, and then really open it up for discussions and um, what you'll be seeing next. So, Really, this plan will serve as a framework for achieving the community's vision for the growth and development um, in the town while establishing feasible steps to meet renewable energy goals of the town. And this comprehensive planning effort will be used to create a healthier, more vibrant, economically competitive and resilient community for Hillsborough. The plan's not just about land use, it's not just about um, preservation, it's really everything um, looking at it holistically for the town um, and incorporating sustainability as a guiding principle. Um, we'll have a climate, act, climate action and resiliency components um, and we're focusing on eight individual chapters that are really going to be um, coordinated with each other throughout. Um, one thing we are really striving for is being very clear on actionable recommendations and paths to meet those goals and objectives. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen plans where there's robust narrative and then you get to the end and you're not really sure where you're supposed to go with it. Um, so we are really trying to define types of actions, timelines, estimated costs, responsible party, and connections between those actions. Um, so what have we been doing to date? We have been meeting a lot with town staff, um, other boards. Um, we've been identifying town strengths and challenges and key indicators for those implementation efforts. Um, we have had our big community visioning exercise, and we've also done some town staff surveys. Um, so a little bit about the survey, we had a little bit of a longer um, 
community survey time frame um, because of COVID and trying to get more people in. Um, but I will say the town staff did an amazing job really reaching out um, on a lot of different venues to get the word out. Um, and we received 9% of the population um, of Hillsboro responded to our survey, which is really um, a great response. We typically see um, like goals of 5%. Um, we have gotten many less responses from even much larger communities. So we were really happy to see this number of responses. Um, and then just to look at, at some of the high level findings, um, just so you know, a full detailed summary of the survey will be in the um, comprehensive sustainability plan. So we had, like I said, a great response. 87% of the respondents live in the town of Hillsboro. Um, we got the most responses from the historic district in West Hillsboro. And I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, but um, more than 50% of the respondents love the town's small town feel. Um, so really thinking about um, managing that and um, the natural and scenic resources that exist. Um, affordability was named as the biggest challenge currently facing Hillsboro. Um, other ones were housing options, connectivity and mobility and infrastructure. And then traffic congestion was the biggest development challenge um, listed in the responses and others development challenges were loss of land due to new development and then lack of sidewalk and greenway connections. A couple of development preferences that we saw um, was 40% of the respond respondents prefer to see an urban development in the commercial and mixed use areas. Um, single family accessory dwellings and townhomes were important housing. And um, for commercial development, people wanted to see grocery stores, small retail, restaurants, bars, and breweries. When we ask respondents about future development, um, they had the top three characteristics, and this is in um, future commercial and multifamily development. Um, was protection and conservation of open spaces, energy efficiency, increased landscaping and tree canopy, which um, was really great for us to see as a town that is prioritizing sustainability. Some of the needs that we saw from the survey was um, from a transportation standpoint, the most pressing need chosen by the respondents was reducing traffic congestion with about 60% of the people um, noting traffic congestion as an issue. Expanding sidewalk infrastructure and access were the most next pressing needs. From a natural resources standpoint, trees and forest preservation, using natural resources to mitigate climate change, and the quality of river and wetlands were the most important. Recreational needs, um, the respondents chose greenways, trails, and venues for arts and culture as investments to prioritize. When asking specifically about sustainability, land conservation and protection, affordability, cost of living, and water supply were important to the respondents. So just a little bit about um, the demographics that we saw in the survey, we use these, this demographic information um, to really pivot if we need to pivot when we're seeing we're not reaching a certain demographic. Um, but just keep in mind that this part of the survey is always voluntary. Um, so it is optional to the respondents, but it, most people complete at least a portion of the demographic questions. So what you're looking at here is blue is 
um, the town of Hillsboro based on the 2019 American Community Survey five-year estimates from the U.S. Census, and then yellow is the survey respondents. So planners typically try and look for a similar percentage um, as kind of you know, a direction of where we need to go. But what we really don't want to see is having zero or no representation from a specific group. Um, and so we were pleased that what we saw for um, the range of income levels and ages in the survey respondents. Um, the town staff did make several efforts um, when we were seeing some populations not getting representation. Um, they went out to um, neighborhood events, different um, publicly accessible events, reached out to different community leaders. So we were able to build up a little more of that representation, which was great. Um, but what we're really here to talk about tonight is the connectivity in the town. Um, the community survey tagged traffic congestion and lack of sidewalk and greenway connections as a challenge the town faces um, and really wanting a reduction in traffic congestion and expansion to the sidewalk infrastructure. Um, so really a lot about the town connectivity. We have seen that in other um, meetings and focus groups that we've had. So this connectivity issue is a huge um, priority for this plan. There's been successful efforts by the town and county of documenting the existing conditions and needs and identifying town priorities. There's several plans that we're using as a baseline um, to guide us to some of these recommendations and the town has identified some um, immediate priorities. We have the town's land use plan, and this is really critical in identifying the needed connections and prioritizing projects, which will be a component that drives the sustainability plan, and really understanding how development is going and how the town's going to grow with, develop, with future development. Um, we also have the bike and pedestrian facilities identified, the public transportation network. We're also looking at um, STIP projects or state funded projects as opportunities for partnerships. And just so everyone's on the same page, um, all of these lefer, le all of these efforts have led to the town's transportation priorities, which are really, um, I don't want to say the most important priorities, but they are the most immediate priorities for the town. And those were recently presented by Stephanie to the town board and the town board approved these priorities. So these will be part of the comprehensive sustainability plan. Um, just to give you an idea of what else will be covered in the transportation and connectivity section of the sustainability plan, we'll be looking at transportation networks, which are the roadways, bridges, transit, rail, um, pedestrian networks, bicycle facilities, um, and sustainability will be woven throughout all of this. We'll be looking at um, transportation patterns and mode choices, um, and really thinking about how land use and transportation connections drive um, how we need to connect in the future. Um, so all of this is really, again, trying to get us to actions and strategies that are implementable. So these are things like partnerships, how to prioritize certain um, opportunities and requests from the community. Um, providing design options and profiles that the town can work with, policy ideas. So, um, and this board may be needed to um, work within those, some of those recommended implementation strategies. Um, so I'm going to pause on the chapter um, 
for the sustainability plan. And I want to introduce Lauren Blackburn, who um, is a colleague of mine, and she's going to walk us through an example of kind of a policy shift that you might see. Um, and this is all around um, complete streets. So we've seen a lot of requests from all of our engagement um, about providing transportation options. Um, and this is one form of doing that. So Lauren, take it away. All right, thanks Candace. Can you hear me okay? Sound great. All right. So um, as Candace mentioned, uh, we wanna give you guys a sort of an overview of maybe what, what probably is and should be a, a different approach for how you might otherwise be thinking about how you would implement what we call complete streets. Um, just before I jump into that, and I didn't think to add a definition for complete streets, but does everybody know generally what complete streets is? Or I probably should go ahead and give kind of a basic overview of what that, that term all includes. Um, complete streets generally refers to a road network, a transportation network that serves the purposes and the needs of all the roadway users who would be expected to be using that particular facility and meeting their needs in such a way that provides the, the maximum comfort, safety, and convenience that they need, understanding that when you do that for one, there's probably going to be a trade-off for others, right? So it's a combination of all those different modal interests and dynamics that ultimately creates complete streets. Sometimes complete streets gets um, talked about only as a bicycle pedestrian type issue. It's not, but we do emphasize a lot about bike and ped when we talk about complete streets because it has all those, those modes of transportation have largely been overlooked for decades, of course. So um, what we want to talk about now is just maybe a different way of kind of thinking about how you would help set the stage for where you would expect different types of complete streets. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about policy as Candace mentioned. Um, the, the, the role of policy for complete streets basically is so that the town um, establishes what they expect for roadways that are being built by developers, roadways being improved by developers, roadways that are maintained by the town, or roadways that are maintained by the state. And so all of those parties have a role to play in developing out the network that you want. Um, the, the basic components of a policy that you could write, and this would basically be a recommendation that would show up in your sustainability plan. Uh, one is that you should set specific goals and a vision for what you expect for complete streets. You know, what is the expectation in terms of the, of the vision for the networks? You know, how easily should it for a uh, person who is walking be able to get to certain types of destinations? Those are types of visionary statements and goals that you could describe. Um, and that also helps translate or inform some of those performance measures. So performance measures are how you measure progress, right? So if you have a goal that you want to be able to provide walkable access to all um, neighborhoods, all residences in Hillsboro within, you know, or a quarter mile walking distance to major road uh, bicycle paths or something like that, then you have to think about your performance measure. How quickly do you wanna get there? What's gonna be your rate of success? So that also goes into your policy. And then the other part of policy, um, I've got the wrong word in here, but you want to define the process for decision-making. So who makes those key decisions? Uh, who is a part of the process? You know, What level of public engagement do you have part of that as well? Um, on the right-hand side, the graphic over there are some of those key components that go into all these things, right? So like I just said, you have to think about who's involved in the decision making. Ideally, you involve the people who are being impacted by the project or by the network at the very beginning. So if, if you're talking about establishing a new bicycle network or if you're looking at setting this policy, you got to think about who is most to gain and who's, who's likely to be most impacted. Um, and that helps you identify what we call your design user. So one kind of key piece of information here, especially when we're talking about bicycle modes and complete streets is that uh, most of the time we are not designing for the person who is very comfortable riding in high volume traffic, high speed traffic. 
We're more often not designing for the family, for the person who's not as comfortable riding in that type of roadway. So we have to think hard about who is in Hillsboro, who's most to benefit and be impacted. So who are we designing for? Because that really helps you identify the next part, which is where are they trying to go? Therefore, kind of, you know, what's the demand? And then finally, what kind of network serves those purposes and those users best? So if you go to the next slide, Candace, um, this is probably going to be what I would say the most important um, um, element that you can include in terms of defining a complete streets approach for your town. And this comes down to what I call design guidelines or some kind of design criteria for selecting the right type of network and facility types for the different contexts. Um, there's a lot going on in this matrix. So let me just kind of explain this. Um, the, the word exposure basically refers to the amount of vehicle traffic and the amount of expected bicycle and pedestrian and or transit user traffic. So of course, the more cars you have on the road, the higher the exposure and or the more people you have walking or bicycling or taking transit, you also have more exposure. So when you think about how, how that compared to speed of the vehicle, of the roadway, where those two things come together, where you have more exposure and you have higher speeds, basically what you end up doing with that combination, those two measures, that's where you would um, require or push for what I call more modal separation. You would have separation of bicycles from traffic, separation of, of increasing separation of pedestrians and so forth in those higher speed, higher exposure environments. And then the opposite can be true as well. So if you're looking at a um, network or a roadway system where you have very low speeds and you don't have as much of an expectation of exposure, you can probably uh, develop out, a, you, can, you can work with um, something that's basically a shared or a slowed street. So maybe you have some traffic calming devices and or some other ways of making it comfortable for everybody to walk on the road without having to have a whole lot of separation. So those are some key things and that all of this is driven by context. So context is basically your land use, right? So your downtown environment is gonna have more exposure, possibly lower speeds, and you have to factor that all in too as well. You know, what do you want in terms of a design um, for those, those different networks? And ultimately what this gives you is flexibility. So this doesn't necessarily generate a specific cross section for every road in your community. This is a tool that you can use to assign, to basically identify what options you would want and then work with whoever is the owner of the roadway or the developer to figure out what makes the most sense because you can, as soon as you come up with a specific cross section for every roadway or a specific bicycle facility that you want for a roadway, you're going to find that there's some, some challenge with implementing that. So it's helpful to have a couple options for every roadway and a tool like this can help you kind of give that flexibility while at the same time setting up, you know, aligning with your goals and your policies. So next slide. Um, what this all feeds into is once you use these types of tools and you have a policy that, you know, you basically are tracking your progress route, then ultimately you're going to end up uh, working with developers, um, roadway owners to de develop projects, transportation projects. And so some of the key questions that you need to ask yourselves is what, what of the, the process applies to the town, to um, other stakeholders? So for example, you know, should a developer-based project who is going through a, what I call by right development approval, you know, they're not having to go through a rezoning or any exceptional approvals, should they and or maybe town projects or DOT projects just go through staff review or do you need, would, how would you want to otherwise treat that? There's different approaches, but you know, this could also kind of feed into how, um, how streamlined you would like for this decision-making to go, right? And then that shows up in your policy. Um, another important thing is, especially in small towns, this can be hard, but you know, do you need or do you have appropriate engineering review expertise. Um, you're getting to basically where you have a cross section, the, the type of pedestrian network that you want for that particular road and so forth is, is one part of it, but ultimately you're, you're looking at a plan set and you're trying to determine is that consistent with your local uh, design standards. So 
that, that may also be something that you need to think about. And then lastly, what, what are the exceptions? Um, would you want to provide exceptions for when you have a major detrimental environmental impact or maybe an impact to a community that's um, vulnerable? Do you want to think about what alternative, when you can choose a prefer, an alternative that's not necessarily your preferred alternative? Or um, do you want to um, continue to exercise some kind of payment in lieu, which has its trade-offs as well? So next slide. So I talked about the policy and I talked about some of those design guideline options, which are context-based. What I didn't talk about is a map. Um, you know, what, what communities um, have done for a long time is make a map for every mode, what the connectivity network, and like I said, sometimes that creates problems because sure as you, as you go look to implement it, you find that you can't fit it all into the same right of way. So you've got to think about those trade-offs. Um, Instead of having a network map or plans that serves as your, um, your, your, your standard or your requirements for complete streets, um, it could be a vision, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the thing that you would, you would say, this is what we will be doing, but it, rather it's just that vision. So those two things above, the policy and the guidelines can help make the network plan, but those first two things are really what should be driving your decision making. And the plan is just the, the sort of the visionary outcome. Um, and like I already said, you know, once you've gotten that far, then you have the tools to be able to review projects, think about how you're gonna um, make final decisions. And then last but not least, documenting those decisions. Um, we haven't done this enough in our country, to be honest. You know, you go through the process, you decide what you're gonna do, and then we don't really take the time to document what did we end up doing, what were the final decisions, and was it consistent with the, the, the guidelines that you have in your policy? So when they're not consistent, what does that mean? Is it not the right fit? Is it not the right policy? Or are you or is it not being applied consistently? So those are the basic types of strategies that I would recommend for more of a complete streets approach, which of course is really in support of that sustainable vision that you guys have for the town. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so I'm gonna pause there and let everyone just digest a little bit. Um, but what we would like to do is really hear from everyone here. Um, just as a reminder, we presented the efforts to date, the town priorities, our chapter sections. Um, we are happy to answer any questions on any of those items. Um, we are happy to get input on any of those items, um, but we would love to focus on what you see as challenges and opportunities for connectivity within Hillsboro. Any questions to start with? It would probably help Candace to stop screen sharing and let everyone okay. come back to turn their cameras back on so we can see each other again. Sure. And just to, um, a, a lot of, you know, the last couple of years have been pretty strange and a lot of the Parks and Rec members are fairly new to the board or have joined during or just before the pandemic. So um, we do have a couple of people that have served for longer that, that remember um, what it used to be like when we were all in a room together and how um, much easier it is to have these kinds of discussions, of course, when we are together. So anyway, uh, I think we've probably all gotten used to this format now over the last couple of years. Um, but just to remind this board that the community connectivity plan, which is part of the town's current comprehensive plan, is developed and um, put forward by the Parks and Recreation Board. So that connectivity plan includes all of the recommendations for sidewalks, crosswalks, uh, greenways, uh, trail connections, and all other pedestrian facilities and amenities in town. Um, all the folks that are that are in this meeting tonight have had lots of experience with the connectivity plan in the past, but it has been a while. <laughs> so
So <laughs> I don't think we don't expect you to remember everything that's in that 80 page document tonight. Um, but you guys are also, you know, citizens and users of the town's sidewalks and greenways. And so um, if there are particular problems that you've seen just as a user and you want to bring those up tonight, that's totally fine. Um, Candace did have a page that flashed pretty quickly about the town's transportation priorities. And just to um, maybe spend a second on that before we jump into the discussion, I presented uh, to the town board back in September a long presentation of all of the different transportation and pedestrian uh, projects that have been talked about but not prioritized in the past. And there was probably 20 projects on that list. Um, after that presentation, the town board prioritized um, sort of three major projects. The first is the roundabouts at Orange Grove Road with Eno Mountain and Mayo. Um, which is a major um, problem from a traffic congestion and traffic flow standpoint. So that project will be scored in the next round of, of spot scoring and hopefully we'll be able to get some funding to move forward with that project. Um, we also prioritized the connector between South Churton Street, which is old 86 and new 86 or highway 70. This is the new road connection that would um, go past the train station site and provide sort of an alternative to 70 business. Um, that'll of course include bicycle and pedestrian facilities on that road. But then the other transportation priority that pertains the most to this board is the greenway connection that from downtown Hillsborough all the way to Cates Creek Park. So this is the greenway that you guys know um, we've talked about many times in pieces. So first a connection from downtown to the train station and then from the train station around Collins Ridge, a pedestrian bridge across I-85 over to Beckett's Ridge Drive and then a greenway connection to Cates Creek Park which would then be accessible for Cornwallis Hills residents, Waterstone residents, all of those neighborhoods to the south of town. That greenway, um, which is a big vision, right? A big project, a big goal and big money is, um, you know, probably the next legacy project here in town. And so that has been prioritized by the town board and will be conducting feasibility studies on that project starting this summer. So I just wanted to kind of go back to that one slide that Candace was on briefly, just to remind you guys that those things have already been prioritized. We are gonna keep working on them. But the discussion tonight, I think is more from the standpoint of you guys live here in town, you guys use town, you know what works and what doesn't work. Um, and without having to remember everything that's in the connectivity plan, if you have any questions about particular areas, we can try to answer some of those tonight. Um, and then the VHB team will lead you through um, some additional questions that we, we would love to get feedback on. So Candace and Lauren, I'm Andrew Landstrom. Uh, thank you for really an excellent presentation. That was, uh, I'm sure just years of work and lots of discussion boiled down to some very, uh, visually easy to digest slides. So thank you for that. Um, you know, my, my question for you all is, uh, you know, the, the projects that Stephanie outlined are certainly big projects and important ones for sure. And certainly, you know, when it comes to connectivity, there's smaller things that can be done that, that might not be as big ticket. Uh, I'm thinking mainly of sidewalks and it's heartening to see that sidewalks are high on that priority list. Cause I, I completely agree that that's an area I think of real opportunity to improve in town. Um, yeah, and, and, and off the top of my head, I'm, I'm thinking of sidewalks in around Cedar Ridge High School. Uh, so I may not look it, but I have a, a son who's in high school. And when I drop him off, um, I, I, you know, there, there are kids walking on, on a very small shoulder with nowhere to go, uh, you know, and they could extend their hand and touch my car as I go by them. Uh, and I know if memory serves me, there was a, a child actually struck there uh, in the last year or two. 
So I'm curious, you know, how, how do you all prioritize sidewalks? Uh, and um, do you have any specific plans uh, for sidewalks in and around schools? So maybe I'll start um, and then Lauren, feel free to jump in on sidewalk prioritization. Um, I know we could spend, we've spent a lot of time on that already. <laughs> um, I know we could spend a lot of time with it, with it tonight um, with this group, but so schools, um, school traffic and transportation has come up several times um, already in talking with town staff, with the town board, um, not just around the high school, but I do think that will be some sort of recommendation or implementation strategy to think about um, other mode options for school transportation, um, not only for safety of the students, which of course is um, the first priority, but also to reduce um, some of that traffic congestion um, with all the schools in and around Hillsboro. Um, so that has come up, not specifically about the high school um, until tonight that I've seen, but um, Lauren, do you wanna talk about sidewalk prioritization? I will talk about sidewalk prioritization, but maybe not using the word sidewalk so much. So here's here's what I mean. Um, kind of going back to that that slide, you don't have to pull it up, Candace, but the one where I was talking about policy, right? So if if you have policy that says that you have, for example, a, a goal, a transportation goal to have um, walkable access to all schools in the town within at least a half mile, mile, whatever, you pick the parameter. And you have a goal uh, that says that um, you want to provide that access to um, areas where there are higher populations of children. Wh whether or not there's a school, you know, you're, you're think, talk, think about in terms of layers, right? So you've got this priority, you've got these goals, these goals. When you stack them up, you're going to find locations which are gonna be your priorities for improving the network period, the complete streets network. Now, then it's like, what do you wanna build there, right? So what makes the most sense for what needs to happen at the place? And then it's kind of setting those priority, the, the design users I mentioned, who are you designing for when you're thinking about connectivity to a school, right? You're thinking about children walking to school, biking to school, but probably mostly walking to school for the most part. So you gotta have at least that fundamental pedestrian network on the ground, right? So I think if you, if you, if you kind of follow that basic, those basic steps, and you, you'll find priority locations and it will be pretty easy to say, this is the most fundamental thing we can build here. And it's gonna be in that case, sidewalks. And I think you're gonna find that to be the answer in like 99% of all <laughs> types of places, unless you've already got all those things, right? So if you've already got sidewalks, you don't need to build more sidewalk, but that's that's generally how it should work is, um, and that way you're, you're using data and goals to help kind of set those priorities instead of it being, I want this in my neighborhood first versus, you know what I mean? Like less qualitative. So it, if you use that kind of layered priority approach, then you will probably find that you want to address the most vulnerable people first in areas where you expect the most um, vulnerable people to be walking and biking or otherwise moving. So I don't know if that, uh, hopefully they answered your question. I, I think so. It's it's, it's certainly very helpful. I, I, you know, like you, I, I view this as an equity issue because, um, you know, the, the 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 demographic of students, by and large, who are walking down that little narrow street are our students of, of lower SES who you know their parents aren't driving them and they're too close to catch the bus. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think it's an equity issue. And, and I'm, I guess I'm curious to just to build upon that. You mentioned you know the need to sort of um, take ends of one, like you know, just individual opinion out of it and. The, be data driven. So how, how is, uh, you know, when you, when you prioritize that on a global sense, how do you actually uh, discern high priority areas uh, outside of just sort of people raising their hand and saying, I have a high priority spot for you to consider? Um, a group like yourselves would be probably the, the main stakeholders and it would be an exercise of saying, all right, let's, let's identify our, our transportation goals. You know, where are you trying to go and who are you, who are you serving, right? So if you got if you if you describe those goals, and 
you'll come up with say five or six of them, right? You don't wanna have so many that you can't do very much with. Then the great news is, and this compared to like even just five years ago, we have data that matches almost everything that you'd probably want to measure. And it's usually in a spatial format. I mean, I can't speak for Stephanie and and them, but my guess is that you know you all have. I mean, we've looked at a lot of maps. You have a lot of good spatial data, so it's a matter of saying this is what matters to us. You pull in that information, a mapped information, but you don't start there by asking people point to where you want to go. You 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 say what are your values, and then you get now that you're going to get stuff and then you're still going to ask the community <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what matters. But it's starting off with that starting point, you know, it's like, did this make sense? And it's harder for people to dispute that that didn't make sense. And, but, you know, GIS exercise, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, Stephanie, can you explain a little bit the uh, difference between in town, out of town, where our schools are and how the yeah. county and the state factor into that, please? That's exactly what I was going to do. So um, so I will also tell Parks and Rec board members that after this meeting, your homework is going to be to go back to the connectivity plan and to look at the maps because the town limits and the ETJ areas are outlined really clearly in the maps and the way that the existing connectivity plan breaks down our recommendations for future resources shows recommendations within town limits versus ones that are in our ETJ or in Orange County jurisdiction. And those are, they're shown in different colors. And that's because we don't have any control over the areas outside of our town limits. So Cedar Ridge High School, Grady Brown, Orange High, and now Orange Middle School are all outside of town limits. And that's why it's not easy to get sidewalks there. And the reason is that those are state roads and NCDOT does not build and maintain sidewalks. The county does not build and maintain sidewalks. Only municipalities build and maintain sidewalks and those schools were sited outside of town limits. That doesn't mean it's impossible, but it means it's very, very tricky um, because there's really no entity that is responsible for building and maintaining sidewalks. Not only that, but in that one particular example of Cedar Ridge, we're also dealing with a very narrow roadway bridge over an interstate. And there, it has been studied um, by NCDOT for improvements. I would suggest that you look on the Town of Hillsborough or Orange County website at the Safe Routes to Schools plan which was adopted in 2014, I think. Um, and that plan was a joint venture between Orange County and the town of Hillsboro. All of the recommendations that are in that plan are still important <laughs> and very few have been accomplished. And the reason is because schools aren't in town. <laughs> so it's very, very hard to add pedestrian um, facilities and amenities. Mm -hmm. But the Safe Routes to School Plan does a really good job of laying that out. And our connectivity plan, we intentionally, let's see, the connectivity plan was, was first written and adopted in 2009, then updated in 2013, and then updated again in 2015. The Safe Routes to School recommendations were pulled into the plan in the 2015 update. So those plans already match. And the comprehensive sustainability plan that the VHB team will be working on will be using those recommendations that already exist in our connectivity plan as the base for moving forward. Um, but there are probably some additional areas of concern or connections that need to be made that have come up since 2015, simply because our town and neighborhoods have grown and changed in the last few years. Uh, yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Lauren and Candice for the, the great presentation. Um, just in thinking about like what Andrew brought in our limitations with where our jurisdiction ends and Orange County begins and um, thinking more about like the goals rather than the locations maybe uh, is what I think something I've heard a couple of times. Um, I think that maybe there is uh, um, an emphasis that could still be put on safety in in town and around, especially in locations where I know that, um, you know, downtown uh, along Churton, along King, huge uh, area for, for folks to visit from outside of town, whether they live here or not, whether they live in the historic district or not, whether they live on the Churton corridor or not. Um, 
I think we always see people parking on side streets, walking, kids biking. There is not really room for sidewalks through those neighborhoods where we're welcoming people into our um, neighborhoods effectively. And I think at the same time, there's a little bit of an incentive for some cars because of the limited north, south, east, west options to use some of these other streets as cut throughs or come through uh, neighborhoods that are less patrolled or whatever, or may not even have stop signs or sidewalks. Um, so I, I think that's something a lot of us have seen also where there's close calls or literally close proximity between pedestrians, children on bikes and cars that are going probably too fast for a side street because they want to avoid the, um, the, the navigating a more um, trafficked main road. Um, I know that that maybe focusing on that sort of idea or that sort of safety or finding ways to dissuade or calm traffic devices to calm traffic. Um, I've even seen, you know, the other extreme of things might be those, um, I don't know what they're called, like vertical pylons at the end of some of the major connectors for roads that actually inhibit through traffic a bit or slow it down and make it less convenient to come flying through, still make it accessible but much safer for bikes and pedestrians on roads that would probably otherwise be pretty calm as opposed to uh, being used as cut throughs without sidewalks and stop signs. Um, and of course I would second Andrew's stuff. I know that um, all the schools are similar, but like Stephanie said, all these state roads are connecting Hillsborough residents and there must be a way to lean on Orange County and say, hey, someone's gonna get hurt or worse um, or it's gonna become more frequent. Um, so that was my thoughts. Yeah, I'll just add one thing, Jesse, thanks for that. Um, so th that is one of the reasons looking at partnerships is so important. Um, we've been coordinating with Orange County. Um, I think the town has been very honest with Orange County about through traffic and, you know, the balance of responsibilities and how we're going to move forward. And um, so that is part of the discussions and will be part of the recommendations um, that is somewhat unique to Hillsborough because of the through traffic that you were just mentioning. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you want to add anything just from, I know you've done a ton of downtown safety studies, just anything um, to follow up to what Jesse mentioned about common scenes for downtown areas. Yeah, uh, Jesse, we need to have a three hour coffee talk about this topic. Um, so I will just keep it real short. Um, I, the word that I like to use because some, you know, safety means a lot of things to different people. And sometimes it means did a crash happen there, whatever. But the word risk, I think is kind of what you were getting at, right? So it's, it's that combination of, is there a risk of, because of the exposure or the speed or the other kind of, um, in, uh, inherent risk factors about that place that should elevate it, right? So, um, and risk is, is gonna lead you to the place and, and risk for where people might be seriously injured or killed is what is probably most important, which sometimes doesn't translate to your neighborhood street, right? So that they're very kind of different kind of priorities or, or ways of describing safety. Um, but when you, if you think about it in terms of risk, that's good, that will, um, help you uh, prioritize to an extent. And then it also is a way of kind of uh, working with partners like DOT and others to figure out, you know, based on these risks, based on these conditions, yeah, we have tight right of way. What are the trade-offs we're willing to make to be able to, to provide those, those much needed improvements so that people can get places safely? So I, that's a, sort of a different way of putting it. And there's a lot of data that can go into that too. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I was thinking more about, so I am a student that goes to Cedar Ridge High School and I drive there every single day. And there's like this one stop sign that's like right outside, that's like right next to the bridge that um, was previously mentioned that I know a lot of like students like walk across the road uh, like they walk across the road to like get to because there's like a neighborhood like right next to it so like like these roads are like walked in a lot and I was thinking about this like one intersection in particular to where it's like oh there's one stop sign and then it's just like 
continuous. I don't know what the road's called. It's I'll probably that's Oakdale, but, Oakdale Drive. Oh, it's Oakdale yeah. Drive at Orange Grove, um, just outside of the city limits. Okay, well, like Oakdale, how it goes, and then there's like an interjection. I don't know what that one's called either with a stop sign, but you can't really like see a lot whenever you're like sitting at that one stop sign because you have like the bridge obstructing it and then like a bush on the other side so it's like hard to see if there's like people walking across the bridge or like another car and like I was thinking about like a stop sign I was thinking about like how traffic lights could be like nice there like pedestrian or like some way like they could like orient or they could make it so that it like regulates basically like cars and like pedestrians so it can make it like safer for like kids to like cross the road there because I know that that's like a heavy like foot traffic area but again I don't know how much we can do because it's like outside of town limits. Perhaps like um, it sounds like you might you might be suggesting like alternatives to a full sidewalk that needs to be maintained but some sort of um you know, warning flash uh, uh, crosswalk kind of thing into the neighborhood, perhaps. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe something that's like, um, like maybe even just like trying to either like reduce the speed limit or like put up like in that specific area, or, like put up a sign that's like, you know, this isn't like technically a school zone, but there's like a lot of foot traffic, a lot of students walking here, like, please be like, focused because like a sign like on the side that like, notifies people that like children are here like sends off a lot in their minds that's like okay maybe I should like slow down like pay more attention it's like if you see something that's like um like if you see like a deer like a deer crossing sign or like not or you know what I'm talking about but it's like there's a lot of deer in this area and stuff like you pay more attention to it or you're like you might drive a little bit closer to the speed limit if you have like if you're going a little bit over or you'll slow down, be a lot more hesitant and like pay more attention. Because if like, it, if we can't like get a sidewalk there, like make a safer place for them to walk, like might as well, like, you know, try and send off some signals and like driver's heads. That's like, Hey, we got kids walking here. Like maybe, so maybe slow down, pay more attention. What's the name of the high school again? Sorry, just real quick. Sorry, one more time. The name of the high school? Uh, Cedar Ridge High School. Okay, all right. Jason, it sounds like there's two issues. There's the speed and then also the visibility. Is that right? Yeah. I'm wondering uh, about like a, if a convex mirror, you know, it angled some way. I, I can't envision what you're seeing. But you know how sometimes there's like a one of those kind of domed mirrors so you can actually see what's coming um, down the road around a turn, if that would be helpful. It doesn't solve the speed problem, but it might solve a visibility issue. Uh, so there I, is so oh, I'm gonna focus you guys for a second because the town of Hillsborough is is small but still big and we got a lot to talk about. The the NCDOT and the schools and Orange County transportation staff are studying that area for pedestrian safety improvements, but it is outside of the town's jurisdiction. So I have participated in those studies just as um really a friend and partner as Lauren and Candace were talking about before, but ultimately the NCDOT and Orange County are gonna have to figure out what improvements can be allowed and the amount of regulations that govern what NCDOT will or won't do in a situation like this are very numerous. So um, as much as I appreciate us trying to solve this problem tonight, I don't think we're gonna solve this one. Um, but I do think that while if Bruce is still on the call, Bruce is a resident that's visiting us tonight and lives in Corbinton Commons. And I'd like to hear um, about some of the stuff that his neighborhood has been facing and thinking about, because this will be the first time the Parks and Rec Board has had a chance to hear directly from Corbinton Commons in a long time. <sighs> Right, I'm a resident of Corbin and Commons. And I think when I first moved here about four years ago, there was a trail envisioned to go from downtown to Air Mount. And uh, we, you know, 
the board met with uh, Stephanie a couple of months ago to talk about this again. And we would like to have that uh, trail uh, back in your plan. Uh, I noticed it was eliminated in the last edition. I forget which year the last edition came out, but how often do you do these? Every three years or so? It's, these, it's three to five years for an update usually. Right. So I'm just soliciting for inclusion in the plan for a trail to come through Corbin and Commons that allows us to access Air Mount, but it would also maybe facilitate walkers from downtown uh, in the King Street area to also walk out to Air Mount. So right now, you guys, Corbinton Commons is a neighborhood just to the east of the historic district, and they, they have a greenway in their neighborhood that is owned and maintained by the neighborhood. It's not owned and maintained by the town. But if you were to walk from, let's see, what is that, Kane Street, the end of Kane Street, there's a little mulch trail by Sans Souci, uh, which is a historic property. That little mulch trail connects over to the Corbinton Commons Greenway. And if you were to keep walking east, you get almost all the way to St. Mary's Road, directly across the street from Airmount. Right now, we have no safe public connect, pedestrian connection to Airmount and Poets Walk in town. And that's because St. Mary's Road, again, is outside of town limits. St. <laughs> Mary's Road is also very narrow and really would not be an easy place for us to construct sidewalks or bike lanes. I will tell you of all, I've been with the town for 15 years and the two projects that people ask me the most about in terms of pedestrian connectivity are how to get people safely to Cedar Ridge and how to get people safely up and down St. Mary's Road for, for different reasons. Those are the two most common asked questions. So you guys are right on target with these projects tonight. Um, but uh, I don't know that the trail was ever, the, the Greenway or trail connection was ever included in the connectivity plan as an actual recommendation. Um, partly because that greenway is not um, owned by the town. It was built for the neighborhood. And so there's a question there about opening up public access, you know, which brings a host of other problems <laughs> that the neighborhood would have to deal with. But certainly um, going back to what Lauren Blackburn was talking about in terms of goals, setting goals for the plan, right? Yeah. Um, having a goal of people to be able to safely walk to Airmount uh, would be pretty high up there because that then, of course, connects, um, eventually will connect to the Speedway, the Mountains to Sea Trail, so on, you know, River State Park, so on and so forth. Right. And that, that's really the only reason why I came to the meeting tonight was to try to get that in the vision. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so do I understand correctly that there is a, I know not the whole thing, I know we're not getting to air mount right now, but um, do I understand correctly that Kane does correct, connect the Corbinton so that to me that looks like and, and would mean that that neighborhood has connectivity to downtown without going on 70 and also that provides some connectivity maybe limiting traversing 70 to just that light to also sort of connect um, to the neighborhoods north of 70 and Orange High School and everything. So there, there is an official town trail there, or this is just like, we can go in the woods and make it happen, but it's technically a, on this property yeah. or what? There's a mulch trail with a public easement that is not handicap accessible. It is a not handicap accessible trail. Not handicap so, but it is an easement, so we're not trespassing. You're not trespassing. Okay. Okay. Um, some residents in Corbinton Commons may argue with that. <laughs> uh, the Corbinton Commons Greenway does not have a public easement on it, but the mulch trail does have a public easement, the little connector piece. So in order to be able to walk from downtown to Airmount, there would need to be a consistent public easement 
and a handicap accessible connection. And so the town, all of the town's um, greenways and sidewalks meet access board design guidelines and ADA code, whichever one governs. Um, that's just one of our goals, again, for town is to make sure that we're not building or, or, or um, sending people on trails that aren't accessible. But it's definitely a connection that uh, would benefit a lot of people. It would have to be worked in partnership with the community that currently owns and maintains that paved greenway. I think Rob, did I? I didn't mean to interrupt you a second ago, did I? Okay. I just had a question. You didn't interrupt me though. Um, Bruce, good to see you. So two questions. Stephanie, if we're talking about access to St. Mary's, what, do, um, what does that entail? Do we need to get, uh, is that private property that, that we're crossing? We have to get how many easements? Um, and then two, and this is for you, Bruce, and, and Corbin and Commons residents, it sounds like that you're envisioning that to be public access. And so... I know that that's a kind of a hot button issue in, in your community right now. And do you see that? Um, I mean, at the same time, it's a, a lot of people, if, if y'all never been out there, um, go check it out. It's a great, great new, um, pretty, pretty new neighborhood. It's not a hundred percent. Well, there's still some street work to be done, but a lot of people walk in, a lot of people bike in, a lot of people just out and about. They're a very active uh, group of individuals. And so, um, they look look for connections um, to downtown, but then if I, the goal of, of being able to connect to St. Mary's and Airmount would be um, phenomenal. Um, and as Stephanie, you know, mentioned also, there is a plan for American Classic Homes to cross the Eno from Airmount to Speedway, and then from there you're you know you're to the Riverwalk and. Um, you have so, so many, you know, so many options from there. So to, I guess, recap, Steph, what does it take? What would it take the town to essentially obtain those easements? And then I uh, just want to clarify, Bruce, that you, that you want or advocating that to be a, a uh, public access. I'm not going to uh, deny that there isn't a little controversy along with this in the community but the community has no idea what you can offer them uh, on improving the trail um, or helping us improve the trail. Um, you know, we might even be willing to sell that out of loop property because, um, but I, you know, I'm talking way out of my position here. So I, I'm just, saying because it's not in the visioning plan now it's hard to talk about in the community yeah, um, yeah. and this would help bring it to the surface uh, you know last time it was in the plan the community hadn't even sold the house yet mm -hmm. yeah we had yeah. always in, we had always hoped and envision that there would be a connection. Rob, to answer your question a second ago, if you go down the mulch trail and then you walk down what's called the phase one Corbinton Commons Greenway to the east. Oh, I've been there. I've, I've sludged okay. through there too. Uh, so Mary's. so you, there's a footbridge <laughs> that's in pretty poor condition at the end. And it's that's where the phase two Corbinton Commons starts. Right. From that footbridge, if you, if you cross that bridge, the property on your right is owned by Classical American Homes. Oh. So between St. Mary's Road and the Greenway is owned by Classical American Homes. So in order to make this whole vision work, the town would need to partner with Classical American Homes and the Corbinton Commons Homeowners Association. And all three of those groups would need to come up with something that worked well for everybody and was handicap accessible. But if that connection could be made and a marked crosswalk. Of course, the other entity is NCDOT because they own and maintain St. Mary's Road and there would have to be some type of um, mid-block crosswalk, pedestrian crossing, which is a different kind of hurdle, um, but not impossible. It has, we have seen them in, uh, installed in our area with, flat, with lots of flashing lights. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, NCDOT, Classical American Homes, Corbington Commons. But that it, it doesn't appear to be, um, it is, that is not a project that has like physical or environmental constraints. The constraints are more about coordination. And I think Bruce also in saying, you know, if it's not in the connectivity plan, like staff also, we don't prioritize finding out these answers for you, right? So the plan not only informs the public, but it informs staff, staff's priorities. That's what we're looking for. <clears throat> And I, I, think, I really, oh, I really don't have anything else to add about that. So I think Stephanie it, did a great job for us. Thanks. And I think that's one thing that um, when we bring recommendations to you for review, um, partnerships, funding opportunities, time frames, you know, those are things we'll want to get input on. Um, to really make sure that they're viable uh, recommendations for the plan. Um, so all the stuff that <clears throat> we just talked about here, if that's really a priority um, for that area and that access, all of the partnerships would be listed as, you know, required and the constraints of working with NCDOT, um, that would all show up in the plan. So it will be documented as Lauren was mentioning. Other, any gaps in other areas or modes um, of transportation? that you see as a citizen in the town? Yeah, Rob, go ahead. So this is just food for thought. You know, I've just seen more and more uh, e-bikes on the road and all over the place these days. And so, you know, moving forward, I'm sure that's gonna be um, part of the conversation but how does that i don't know a lot of policy that's been written for municipalities regarding that now whether it's on greenways or um obviously if they're in streets they should be um following the rules of the road just like all other vehicles but just um to have that in the back of your mind because i don't think e-bikes are going away anytime soon not to mention other electrical modes of transportation Lauren or Don, anything you've heard recently about e-bikes? Um, I know, I know t um, the town of Hilton has, has a policy against them. Um, I heard from NCDOT, so I was, but that's the latest I've heard on e-bikes. So e-bikes are bicycles according to their manufacturing standards. So. They are given the, you know, this the same requirements, privileges, all of that as as any other bicycle. Now uh, that's different from uh, other motorized motor assist vehicle things, mopeds, <laughs> etc. I have different terminology, and and that's where things get a little little weird. Like you have to make sure you know what you're talking about, but. E-bikes are regulated. They can only go so fast. And yeah, they, I mean, I'd say it all the time. I'm going to be the last person on the planet who will buy an e-bike, but just because I'm stubborn, but they go a lot faster than I do when I'm going up a hill, but um, they have to abide by the same rules as, as un un unassisted bicycles. But if, you know, you're not actually talking about an e-bike, then, then the rules are different. I don't know how Hilton Head could yeah. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I'm like, huh, that's interesting. But, you know, South Carolina, different place. Um, yeah. Now, golf carts sometimes come up into that. That requires specific legislation. 
uh, or ordinances and like I said, you know, other kind of in between vehicle types, mopeds, um, motorcycles, other electric or motorized assisted things have to each of them have to be categorized and you still have the ability at the town level to say what you um, beyond like bicycles pedestrians you know what do you want on greenways you can you can regulate what types of vehicles you allow I will um, just throw out mostly for the information for board members two other um projects that I hear a lot about from community members. One is having a bicycle connection from Riverwalk phase three to Elizabeth Brady Road. Um, right now that section of trail is owned by Classical American Homes Preservation Trust and does not allow bicycles. It's a pedestrian only trail. And because of that, folks who are trying to commute to town from Forest Ridge and 70, um, Old NC 10 and all of those neighborhoods out east um, are sort of forced to use 70 business, which is a really unsafe route. So of course, if our new roadway project connector goes through, there may be better bicycle facilities in that area, but I think it's still worth in any type of future recommendation and partnership um, to just continue to try to work on um, that section between Riverwalk Phase 3 and Elizabeth Brady Road. I mean, ho hopefully someday bicycles could be allowed, maybe it may come down to the town being willing to contribute to maintenance funds if that's what the concern is. Um, so that's one project. The second one is in our connectivity plan, there's a map that's called destinations and it outlines kind of all of our main destinations in town. That was updated in 2015. But since then, the, the what used to be the Fairview Community Police Station is now a community center. Um, you guys will remember a couple, I, I guess it's been almost a year now that the town board has been working with the Fairview Community Watch to allow that building to be a community center. And I've attended a couple community watch meetings and some um, community cleanup days. I think Rob, you were with me at the day where the, com the community was working with some interns to look at walkability in that neighborhood. And one of the key recommendations was a sidewalk connection between Rainy Avenue and the community center, um, which is a fairly easy connection, but it, and it is along a town road. So it doesn't include, it doesn't need any partnership. It just needs funding. That's a funding problem. Um, and, and it's not in the it's not in the current connectivity plan. So when we look at recommendations, I think that's one that we should definitely consider. We have had direct um, communication from area residents and and the community watch about the essential nature of that connection. Um, one thing I will add, just while everyone might be thinking through um, some additional thoughts, um, is we have heard bike and pedestrian connections as a priority in every meeting, focus group, um, staff meeting, survey that we've had for this plan. And so it will be really one of our top priorities of this plan is, you know, transportation options as an important piece of sustainability um, for the town moving forward. So um, just keep that in mind. All these discussions and brainstorming options on um, the different modes are really helpful to hear. Other thoughts, anything else on, um, so we'll have a parking chat um, section, um, transit we're looking at, we're um, scheduling a meeting with uh, Orange County and Go Triangle Now to talk through 
transit options. Any other yeah, thoughts? I mean, that's something I hear in town all the time is just, uh, it would be lovely, uh, amazing, maybe help with traffic, maybe help bring people to town for our events and stuff. Also help us get to, you know, Chapel Hill, Durham, wherever, if we had more uh, transit options, more, more routes, uh, more options for making um, commuting that way feasible and affordable. Um, right now, I think, depending on the day, it's, it's, it can be really tricky and take a really long time to take a bus somewhere, especially for like work if you're trying to plan when you're also coming home. And that's something I've heard um, a lot for a long time from a lot of people. Yeah, I've been hearing more recently about trying to think creatively about park and rides not being, um, we have a lot of events in town and the, 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 the folks who put on events are really good at coordinating transportation for those events. But those events oftentimes mimic some of our traffic patterns that we get just on regular Friday and Saturday nights or, or Saturdays during the day or just busy particularly busy times of year, but um, without an event, there may be ways for park and rides um, to be used, like transit buses, the Orange County, the smaller vans, even for schools, you know, like maybe there's a way for schools, kids to just get on the little bus to go across the bridge safely, right? Like we just like that creative thinking about how to use how to ride share and how to use um, like a park and ride mentality for those. What do they call it, Lauren? It's like, there's like a planning term for it. It's like that last, um, last mile, the last mile. Exactly. You know, so, but trying to Hillsborough is a small town and we're at Rob will know the town board likes to say, we're a town that likes to try things. Right. We're a great venue for trying weird out of the box things because there aren't a lot of hurdles to us doing weird stuff, right? And so that last mile mentality of like, okay, if the real problem is just getting kids across this bridge at 245 every day, how can we solve that without having to build an entirely new bridge that goes over an interstate, right? Or if our real problem is Fridays from four to seven o'clock, and that's where we're seeing these big traffic jams, what can we do about that, right? Um, so anyway, I don't have the answers, but I, li I like the idea of your team. <laughs> <laughs> thinking about it, right? And and offering some uh, new and creative possibilities. And to add to that, uh, for what it's worth, um, it might be it it might be um, beneficial to talk to someone else might be able to help me out with if this is a committee or it's the art council themselves. But I know last Fridays there's a, a group uh, committee talking about how to improve or change or try things for last Fridays. And one of the things um, I happen to know, one of the people on the, I'm calling it a committee for lack of a better term, uh, but they're even looking into ways to like shut down part of King Street and block it off for the events. And they've, I know he's thought and they've talked about what does that mean for parking and how do we bring people in or out and where can we identify some of the larger parking areas like Nash Street Tavern or uh, the, the parking deck or even as far as like the, um, uh, I'm drawing light out, out by 40, the neighborhoods where there might be opportunity for more parking and park and rides for events. And maybe that translates into eventually some sort of schedule for um, ongoing um, transportation, park and rides. Um, but it might be worth talking with them. I'm not sure if that event last Friday could translate into some ideas and maybe some logistics for other times as well. I think they even yeah, that's a great idea. We talked about doing some pop-ups last Fridays too, um, potentially in the spring. So I think that's a great, a great suggestion. I know he even mentioned this is one more thing just to get it documented or to put it in everyone's ear. Um, but they even talked about getting, you know, for events, but who knows, maybe other times too, those uh, like bike taxis where you could even bring people from the Nash Street parking lot to downtown from the Nash Street. Uh, from where they have more room for parking. Um, but who knows, maybe there's a market for that too.
petty cabs, I guess, right? They have that in Raleigh and some other spots. Mm -hmm. And they're popular. See them all the time. Um, well, I mean, our team could talk about this all night. So I do want to be um, respectful of everybody's time and your agenda. Um, any, uh, I would just say that please, if you think of something, um, you are welcome to reach out to Stephanie and she can tag us and we um, will be back in front of you. Um, where we are right now is um, over kind of the December, January months, we've been really like focused with our heads down on kind of getting some narrative down on paper, thinking about recommendations. Um, and so we'll be back in front of you um, in kind of the February, March timeframe with some recommendations to think through. Um, you know, and those can all, we can always add to those. We can talk through if those are actually viable. What we really want, again, is stuff that the town can use. So not a lot of fluff that sometimes are in plans. Um, and then once, once we get some feedback on all the different chapters, um, we'll take that out to the public and get public comment on the recommendations in the narrative and then we'll be finalizing the plan so that's just a high level um summary of the schedule there is information on the town website about the process um different engagement opportunities um so we are always happy to get emails have phone calls um on ideas Great. Thanks, you guys. It's been a, a good discussion. And again, anyone can can keep we can keep this going. Send me emails if you guys want me to share stuff and we'll invite VHB back probably to our March meeting. Cool. Thank you. all Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.